Welcome to Lyme Time. I'm Allie from the Tick Chicks. We are all more than Lyme disease and chronic illness, and together we stand with you to overcome and rise. I'll bring you closer to the experts in cutting edge treatments and even a few unexpected ways of healing. I'll ask the questions you want answers to regarding Lyme disease and successful ways of getting you closer to 100%. We are in this together and will not be defined by Lyme. Emily Buchan grew up on a sixth generation cattle ranch in Arizona, but now lives with her husband Brennan and her beagle Moo in Orange County, California. Alongside her husband, they've built a mentoring and coaching company for aspiring entrepreneurs that allows them to have more freedom in their lives compared to the typical nine to five career schedule. The time flexibility that their business has created has allowed Emily to focus on her healing as she was diagnosed with Lyme disease and multiple co-infections a couple of years back. In addition to the Lyme and co-infections, she has also gone through lots of mold problems, finding high toxicity levels in their prior apartment as well as in her body. She wanted to take an alternative approach to antibiotics and mainstream medicine, so her and her husband have researched extensively, finding the best doctors and best healing modalities for her symptoms. Since being diagnosed, she's experienced so much healing from being in a state of chronic illness and not often been able to get out of her own bed, to now living an active and almost pain-free life. Healing and health is a never-ending journey, but she's excited to share some of her tips for healing both mentally and physically. Emily loves to share her favorite recipes that are mostly low food map and allergen friendly, mindset tips, as well as other health hacks that she's learned and utilized over her journey of healing on her Instagram, Emily Ann Bucken. And I'll tell you how to get to that um, and I'll spell it all out for you at the end of this. But I first, I just dying to welcome Emily. Hi. Hi. So happy to be here with you. Your podcast is amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, I just have found that there are so many angles to healing Lyme disease and, you know, being an influencer, you just have a big voice in this field and we wanted to bring you in and just kind of explore a little bit about what works for you. As we all know, everything, you know, <laughs> works differently on different people. So, yeah. but there's so much knowledge in what you're about to tell us. And I think that some of the treatments, especially water fasting and fasting, which we're going to get to, um, can be misunderstood. And I just wanted to get your take on all of that. So I'm going to jump right in. Um, first of all, just can you give us a little background as to your own personal journey before Lyme and how you came to get diagnosed with Lyme disease? Yeah, absolutely. Again, thank you so much for having me on. I think you add, you guys add so much value to people who are just experiencing a diagnosis or people are kind of along in their journey and just ha having people be connected is so important because sometimes you just feel so alone. And for a long time, for most people, you feel so misunderstood because I do still think it's a, it's an illness that not every doctor even considers to be a huge prominent problem you know so I, I love what you guys are doing and I'm so happy to be on and um, but yeah my uh, my Lyme diagnosis happened in 2018 so uh, for a couple years now I've had the diagnosis and actually so I grew up on a ranch like you had mentioned and I think all my problems actually started there because um, I think as a young kid, uh, a young girl I had always a ton of gut problems so my immune system, my gut was already compromised. Um, and I actually don't remember, you know, a tick actually being leached on into me and like, oh my goodness, you know, I have a tick on me, I have to get up. I honestly don't remember anything like that, but I always remember my gut being really bad, you know, um, all growing up. And I think partly that was due to having parasites, which I do have. And those are little devils to get rid of. Um, but uh, I was a wild child and like always hung out with my dad. Um, my dad's a cow rancher. And so he, um, he and I were always like, I don't know, nibbling on the cow grain and, you know, drinking water from the creek on our ranch. And I think we just didn't think much of it, but I think I picked up some critters um, when I was young and I think I've had them for years. 
And then um, when I was 10, so we're going way back, but when I was 10, um, I, a lot of doctors actually thought I had celiac and it kind of took some time to get to that point. But as like nine, 10, 11, around that age, I was, I remember I was always in the bathroom. My gut was always just in so much pain. I was so bloated uh, and I just felt terrible after everything I ate. And so back then, I mean, now gluten, eating gluten-free is like super popular and everyone knows what gluten is now. However, back then when I was 10, no one knew what that was, you know? So it kind of took some time to get to that point, but uh, they ruled out celiac, which was a blessing, but I had a severe gluten allergy, which since, so for, since I was 10, I haven't eaten any gluten. Um, and then I feel like my gut was okay. Um, and then really until college, it kind of all the things started to go to, um, to hell because I got mono my freshman year from my boyfriend, now husband at the time, but he was really sick and I uh, got mono my first year. And then also in my first year two of college, my gut just started flaring up again and uh, just bloated all the time. And I felt like I had a lot of just brain fog, uh, cognitive, just stuff going on. And, um, and I wouldn't, I know this is probably TMI, but I wouldn't go number two. I wouldn't go poop for like weeks on end. I remember one, one time it was like up to 11 days where I didn't have one bowel movement. And so it was just really bad. And I've always been super active. I was running track in college. Um, and I think obviously being an uneducated, you know, young girl, I was so focused on what I looked like. And I always felt like my stomach was so bloated and I just couldn't lose weight and just always in just a sort of um, state of unease. And so I didn't know what I was doing back then. And I remember just um, trying to not eat. So it would go down. And I just think it just put extra stressors on my body. And um, so anyways, my gut was really bad all growing up. And then later found another doctor and um, did multiple allergy panels. And this time it came back with a whole new slew of things I was allergic to. So obviously still gluten, uh, dairy, eggs, soy, corn, pea, like a whole lot of stuff. And so, and I've always been really disciplined. So I was like, okay, done, never eat again. So since, gosh, I was 18, I've been off of all the other things, you know? But I think what I've learned now is that I was, struggling with leaky gut. And I think whatever I ate a lot of, it would have reflected on an allergy panel and I still would have had sensitivities to it. Um, cause it changed, you know, I kept doing different allergy panels and every time, you know, the food would change, you know? So, um, but anyways, when my husband and I got married in 2014, we moved into an apartment and we were broke as a joke. <laughs> we had no money. So we moved into the only apartment we could afford. And I was at the time working in retail management in uh, Newport Beach at Fashion Island. And so we got apartments um, right by Fashion Island. So obviously great location. However, really old apartments and right by the ocean and the, that dewy air, we later, you know, two years, I think it was like two years in to living there we found out that there was severe toxic black mold and it was that, I mean, I could talk about forever, but it was, we were again, so young and we didn't know, you know, much about mold illness or mycotoxins or anything. We told our apartment community and then they came in and tried to patch it up. They painted over all the black mold oh my gosh. in our bathroom. Yes. <laughs> They put in this huge like HVAC system and blew like a ton of air just all throughout our apartment. Then after that, my symptoms just went from pretty bad to like extremely bad. <laughs> Cause I, the, the, the blower that they put in started stirring up all those mycotoxins into the whole apartment. So very, very sick. So anyways, um, yeah, that, that was a long story in and of itself, but it wasn't actually until we were dealing with the mold and trying to detox my body for, I believe it was almost a year and a half until my doctor tested for Lyme and I tested positive. My symptoms were just continuing. Mm -hmm. And obviously, yes, I was dealing with the mold, but I just, she had a hunch that, okay, obviously you're amino, uh, you're, you're amino compromised. 
you have you know gut issues obviously you have this mold exposure let's let's test for Lyme which I'm happy she did and then it came back positive and also positive for every single co-infection <laughs> which was not very fun <laughs> the whole gang tested positive so that, and that yeah, happened it's, it's kind of a double-edged sword you want somebody to tell you exactly what's going on with you and then you finally get the diagnosis and it's something nobody knows how to do anything with so then begins your journey and so you know let's let's just talk about were you already an influencer before this diagnosis were you already on social media in that way or did, I was did it, I, oh sorry ahead. yeah I was um on Instagram and I actually had a blog, but in college, I feel like I was just, I was just not a person meant for college. I was always, I feel like more entrepreneurial minded. I had little small businesses all through college and through college, honestly, my main focus was my blog, which was at the time more geared towards fashion. And, uh, and so I, um, was posting in, regards to that. And uh, then later on, my, my husband went to graduated his undergrad and he was a bio major. And then he went on to go to chiropractic school and then also get his functional medicine um, license. Oh, that's um, amazing. Wow. So, yeah. So I think a lot of the, the reason why I post what I do now is obviously I've been through it and I've learned so much, but also he's a big influence on me because he has, um, just always had this, I guess not always, but um, in the past, I don't know, 10 years, he's had this mindset of, you know, the body can heal itself. Let's try to expose it to great things. Let's go back to the basics. Let's make sure we're getting sun. Let's look at our food. Let's look at, you know, uh, grounding, just like basic things that can be profound that oftentimes mainstream medical doesn't acknowledge. It's so fascinating that he's um, a functional medicine doctor now and the journey that you guys can take together. And it's also fascinating to me that he was exposed to mono and mold, yet doesn't have any symptoms of Lyme disease or not. Because I've often wondered, oh my gosh, are you just automatically predisposed um, to that? And, and so it's, it's kind of, a, I'm, I'm jealous actually. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> um, but, True. Um, okay, so let's talk about diet. Um, this is a huge issue that I think people push against initially. They really don't want to hear that diet can affect symptoms in every single way. It just seems like too simple of an answer. Mm -hmm. But tell me about your, uh, what you have found works for you specifically with diet. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and going back to, to my husband, it has been such a blessing to, to walk through this together. And, and it was so weird having that understanding of, oh my goodness, you're going through the same you know, environment issues that I am. Why are you not as sick as I am? You know? Right. And so that was really a point of confusion for a long time because he had some respiratory things. I think from the mold, he had a lot of, um, uh, mucus, uh, I think biofilm in his nose and then just a lot of just some respiratory coughing a lot, but it was nothing in the sense of what I was going through. And so it was so confusing. And I think what I've I guess my best understanding and how I understand it now is, you know, when I went into that moldy building, if you think of like a, a boxer in a, a, in a boxing ring and, you know, let's say the boxer has already two huge hits against him, he's going to be way easier to knock out than the boxer that comes into the ring and is strong and doesn't have any hits against him. And I, and someone told me that analogy and that just totally made sense to me because I had already had a compromised gut. I had already, my immune system was already low. I had had mono. I don't really fully know if I've recovered. I had little major illnesses for a long time after college. And so when I got into that building, uh, mold is very opportunistic. And so it'll go towards the person who is a little bit weaker, you know, whether their immune system's compromised. And it'll also go in the place where that compromise is. So really, it, I think it affected my gut you know, tenfold and just a lot of other things. And I also think, you know, that my Lyme disease and all the other 
critters and the co-infections that were inside me, I think I had had them before the mold, you know, but that mold just took my immune system from where it was normally functioning to, you know, rock bottom. And then everything started rising up. Well, it's like the mold, I guess, didn't cause it, but it kind of revealed it. Right. I think, you know, and so, yeah, we just triggered another, and I often will say Lyme disease is kind of like this blanket term for autoimmune, or autoimmune dysfunction right. and, and to try not to be obsessed with eradicating the specific bacteria. It's just more of a focus of really supporting your immune system. And, and, and that's why we're talking to you today are different ways of supporting your immune system because there are so many ways to help it out. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's really fascinating and actually crazy. The statistics, the statistics of how many people have Lyme that struggle with Lyme. And then also piggybacking with that is the mold. You know, a lot of people that are living in a moldy building that maybe have had Lyme or any other autoimmune diseases, if they're still having symptoms or different symptoms, I would ASAP get their environment checked, you know, their workplace, their home. And there's a lot of tests for that, but I would recommend probably the ERMI test because it tests for all the 36 different types of mold. And um, it's, it'll give you kind of like a number on a scale. And uh, when we got that back, I gave it to my doctor. She's like, you shouldn't go back to your apartment. This wow. is so high level, toxic, uh, toxic levels. And then from there, we really did to get rid of like everything because mold and the mycotoxins, it's not like the actual mold that's the problem it's the the toxins that in which it omits and those little things will go everywhere and so porous items you know we got rid of everything like our bedding clothes shoes you know pillows blankets paper books because it can cause cross contamination to the new space that you're moving into so sure but sure and and you know mold is is such a trigger. I never had a reaction with mold until just about almost a year ago. So it mm -hmm. came later for me. And I mean, I was down for three months. I couldn't function. Yeah. <laughs> like, wait a minute, this is so weird. I haven't had a, you know, a, an episode in so long. So right. I know firsthand that it's a real thing and it's, it's, it's really stinks. Um, okay. So let's go back to diet. Um, let's start with diet. And also let's talk a bit about fasting. Awesome. Well, as far as diet goes, like you've been mentioning, and I totally agree, it's such a personal thing, you know, and I think diets is something that the individual person that has to go through. And I, I mean, I think if you feel like you're having any sort of reaction towards food, whether it's an allergy, I think if it's an allergy, you would know it because allergy, like actual food allergies would are most likely in relation to like shellfish, peanuts, strawberries, and it causes an immediate response anaphylactic typically. But if you, you know, have brain fog or, you know, gut issues, you know, diarrhea, constipation, um, skin issues, uh, cognitive stuff, uh, I, I would maybe try to figure out potentially what you're intolerant to because that did help me a lot. And I think a good place to start is probably potentially eliminating gluten for some time. Uh, gluten, regardless of if you're intolerant or not, it causes a ton of inflammation. And dairy also is uh, another popular one that's, that causes a delayed response um, to, towards uh, intolerance. So gluten, dairy, probably corn, um, those are maybe a few places that you could start with if, if someone is experiencing maybe a reaction or maybe you just you just feel like something's not right and obviously so many symptoms can be they're they're all related i feel like the lyme symptoms the mold symptoms you know food stuff it can all be a similar symptom um potentially and so it does take some time to figure it out but i do think you know if people just want to be more healthy reduce inflammation probably minimizing or eliminating gluten um, and sugar. I mean, sugar is not good for, for anyone. It's, it feeds infection and uh, it causes a lot of inflammation. And so I think, you know, it's taken time. And like I said, since I was 10, I've been off gluten. Since I was like 18, I've been off of all the other 
um, like corn, soy, dairy, those type of foods. And then further um, than that, right now I'm currently eating a low FOD, low FODMAP. And um, you can look, if, if listeners are curious as to what that is, low FODMAP foods are, are just in a kind of condensed version, just foods that cause less inflammation. Um, than let's say a high FODMAP food. A high FODMAP food, for example, would be Brussels sprouts, cabbage, high fructose um, fruits, like pears, cherries, um, garlic, onion, uh, just things that typically would cause gas or just a difficulty digesting. Low FODMAP foods are, low FODMAP foods are just easier to digest and more low inflammatory foods. So right now I'm trying that. And then um, something else that I also did when I was trying to heal my gut wall and my gut lining for my leaky gut was the GAPS diet, which I'm sure some listeners may have heard of that, but it stands for the gut and psychology syndrome. And it's just meant to obviously help. It actually helps a lot with autism, um, but it's meant to heal the gut wall, gut lining. And when your gut's healed, your brain also, um, your brain function obviously increases because those are so tied together. But um, that's basically, it's a pretty tough diet, but it's basically an elimination diet times 10. Like you are just eliminating everything and then slowly building um, back on top of. So it it incorporates a ton of bone broths and then slowly incorporates um, foods. And then obviously when you're eliminating everything and then slowly bringing things back in, it's really easy to figure out what you are sensitive to. Um, So that's, that's another one. And then um, I think just on a basic level, um, I think, you know, I'm a firm believer in eating organic and trying to minimize processed foods and minimize GMOs, you know, and, and in relation to mold as well, you know, um, getting rid of some of those high mold contaminated foods, potentially like a dairy, um, cheese, and also actually, interestingly, coffee is one of the highest mold sources, um, foods, you know, that in America, it's, it's actually kind of sad, but a lot of countries say this coffee is no good, you know, and they send it to America because oh my gosh, America, <laughs> because America uh, has less standards for the, the processes of coffee. And so most likely like Starbucks, I'm sorry, Starbucks, Pete's coffee, just like the traditional kind of coffee roasters and coffee places, they're serving moldy coffee probably. Um, so I would look for coffee that's high elevation. Um, and you can see it on the bag, but a uh, one that I trust is always, of course, the Bulletproof brand because, um, the founder of that Dave Asprey obviously went through a lot of mold things and has a lot of processes to roasting his, his coffee beans. Keon coffee is another one that has that, um, which is, uh, Ben Greenfield's company as well. Hmm. So um, awesome. And what about um, fasting? What yeah. types of fasts do you prefer and how long do you do them? And do you, you know, how often do you do them? That kind of thing. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, fasting, I do think, like you mentioned earlier, it is a little bit controversial because I think in our American culture, it said, you know, breakfast is the most important meal, you know, never skip a meal. Uh, it's important to eat three meals a day or to boost your metabolism. You need to eat six meals a day, you know, all these things. And I think some of the science that's coming out actually doesn't, you know, prove the opposite. And so fasting is just, it's not starving because starving would be that you actually don't have control whether you eat or not and you don't have food and it's, and it's different, you know, whether it's mindset or anything. Um, and fasting is just you saying, okay, I'm going to take a break. I'm going to not eat for this amount of time. And there's, like you mentioned, a lot of different types of fasting. You know, you can do intermittent fasting, which maybe is a good place to start if someone's not experienced in fasting. Intermittent usually starts at around 12 hours, which would be probably the minimum, and then up to, I don't know, 16 to 18 hours. So you're just eating in a very limited um, window, uh, and that helps with bringing your body into ketosis, which usually most Americans eat a very rich in carbohydrate diet. And so they're used to having their body use carbs and sugars to, to, for energy. And then with, you know, ketosis, ketosis just means you're burning fat for fuel. And a lot of times people um, can't get to that place, but when you do get to that place, it's actually really efficient 
And uh, when I go into ketosis, I feel very clear. Mm -hmm. And uh, and and I think having your body adapted to both ways of using energy is really beneficial. Um, and how long does it take for you to get into ketosis? Yeah, I think so. I recently did a 14 day fast, which was a long one. Um, but I the first several days, like day one, two, and three, was absolute horror for me. <laughs> and I think because my body hadn't used fat for fuel in a long time. And uh, I think my body, whether it's my illnesses that I go through, I don't know, it's just sometimes not, not as responsive as other people's. And so I just typically think, okay, if it takes the average person, you know, this long to get into, into ketosis, whether it's 24 hours or two days, I'll probably take 24 hours to 48 hours to maybe dip into ketosis. And so I think because my body hadn't been there much before, um, and I wasn't eating keto, you know, if you eat more of a ketogenic diet, obviously that's the whole point, but is to use fat for fuel and eat more fat and no carbs. Um, but I hadn't been eating that way. And so for me, I think it probably took two days, three days to get into ketosis. And then once I was in ketosis, I felt good. You know, I, I felt clear. Uh, I felt, I felt good, you know, and I, I and it's interesting because you can kind of tell when your body gets to that place. But I think on average, maybe 48 hours to 72 hours to get into ketosis. Or again, if you don't want to fast, just eating keto diet, it'll eventually get your body into ketosis. I see. Um, okay. And then for those of that, those of you who don't know, I mean, we're not talking about a cleanse. We're talking about specific fasting. So on your 14 days, which I don't recommend, I, I mean, five days is really a challenge for me, but just like you said, I don't get going until day three. And then all of a sudden I do, I can make it through five days easily, but then, you know, I'm ready to, to quit at that point too. And I've also found that it resets my body and my symptoms. So it's really important for me to do that when I've been, let's say, you know, after I've been traveling or something where I've been eating random foods that, I, you know, were only accessible to me during that period of time. And maybe I start feeling a little symptomatic again. I will do a, a, at least a five day fast, but on your fast, what, what types of, what does that look like on a daily basis? What are you actually putting into your body? Right. So for my 14 day fast, I did eight days of only water. And obviously if you are doing a water fast and I'm not a doctor, so don't just go do a 14 day fast. That's a lot. That's severe. I think if you do want to fast again, try intermittent, maybe try a 24 hour, you know? Um, but what that looked like for me was obviously looking at my water source, making sure it's clean, good source water and uh, drinking water. And then also during my fast two, uh, my water fast, I did minerals. So I added uh, trace minerals. And then also there's a company called Keton Minerals, I believe. And they're little vials in glass vials. And it's sourced from like the most mineral dense seawater on the planet. <laughs> I don't know. My husband again found this for me. So uh, I took those, which was a great source of a lot of good minerals. And then I added, again, like I said, trace minerals and then some um, Celtic sea salt in my water. Um, because if you don't take minerals and you're only doing water, your body will probably cramp up. And, you, it, and uh, so that's, that's why I did that. Um, and then on day eight or day nine through day 14, I continued the water, I continued the minerals only, and then I added in bone broth. So I made my own bone broth. Um, a recipe is on my Instagram if you guys are if you guys are curious. And then also, if you don't have time to make it, another company that's really good if you just want to go to a store and get bone broth is Kettle and Fire, and they um, make their bone broth and let it simmer for I believe 48 hours, which is really the main difference between a br a bone broth and just a, like a stock because a stock maybe is made in a, an hour or two, a bone broth when it gets really um, healthy and you're getting all those great minerals and nutrients from those, the, the bones that they're, you know, boiling is really at 48 hours plus. And so I did bone broths and then later on also I added in some vegetable juices. So cucumber, lemon, lime, and uh, celery. 
And do you and just consume the bone broth by itself? I do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Just heated it up. If the bone broth, if you make your own, it gets gelatinized. So it looks like that disgusting jello -y stuff on top, but just heat it up. And again, if you don't want to deal with that stuff, just get the kettle on fire. <laughs> um, but yeah, I just heated it up and then drank it plain. And so it was from that point, it went from a full water fast into like a, a liquid, a liquid fast where I was consuming some nutrients. Obviously it was still very, very low calorie, but um, I was getting some um, things to start rebooting my system. Cause I think when people are fasting, they think the hardest part is the actual fast. It's actually the refeeding stage because when you know that, that time is up, you're like, okay, I'm done with my fast. Now I'm going to eat. You can go crazy and just totally <laughs> just overstuff yourself and, and right. eat not the right. So I think that refeed stage is really important. And so that's why I did that day nine through 14, just really helping my body kind of waken up again, start digesting a little bit. Um, and from that fast, my goodness, my whole digestive system was rebooted. I, would, I had a lot of skin rashes going into the, uh, into the fast. They were all gone, uh, a lot of mental clarity. So I had a lot of success with it. And obviously too, with um, some of the parasites that I have, it's starving them. So they can't feed on anything. So mm -hmm. the first several days, I think my symptoms were terrible too, obviously going into ketosis, but also because they were hungry and they wanted, you know, food. And so my stomach was hugely bloated for like, like a rock, like I was pregnant, you know, um, for up to the first week, you know, I'd say, and then it started to taper off. So I think that's probably a good telltale that you may be experiencing something else going on in your system. Like if, if you wake up in a fasted state or you intermittent fast and your stomach's hard as a rock and really inflamed, you may have something going on internally that you and take a look at. Does fasting also help with parasites or not so much? I don't, I don't know much about getting rid of those guys. Yeah. So the challenging thing with the parasites is kind of like, it's, this is a weird analogy, but kind of like the scum on top of a pond, it's kind of, so when a parasite goes into your intestine, it creates like a biofilm, which is kind of like in relation is kind of like that scum on top of a pond and it kind of protects the, the water. And so that biofilm is going over that parasite in almost like a protective layer. Mm -hmm. So they're really challenging to get out. Um, and so from what I've researched and found, it can be helpful because you are starving them, putting them in a stressful state. And I think that biofilm will start to loosen. They become weaker and then you can flush it out, whether through a colonic or coffee enemas. Um, I, I do very regularly as well. So I do think that they help. I, I think that there's a lot of um, supplementation and different things that also break up that biofilm film as well that can, that can help. And you that. for people out there who want to know how to test for parasites, if they suspect this, they go to a functional medicine doctor or an MD. What kind of tests do they do for that? I did. Um, I went to my doctor who was she was an MD, however, she was alternative. We did so many tests back then, I think. So I did a SIBO test, which is breath, the breath test, tested positive. And then she did some muscle testing. And then I believe, uh, I, I know I did a couple of um, stool tests as well. Yeah. Um, actually, I just recently did one because I went to a new doctor and that's what he recommended as well, just to figure out what's going on in there. And it was through a lab in randomly uh, Nigeria. So I don't know. I think it, maybe it was through, I'm not sure. I can get that info to you, but I believe through stool. I'm not sure on that. I did feel like so many tests. Yeah, um, I'm sure. I'm sure. Um, so also I wanted to talk a little bit about on your, on your Instagram, you talk about mindset for healing and also other everyday treatments that you love. So maybe first talk about mindset and then tell us a couple of other treatments that you love. Yeah, absolutely. I think as far as the mindset stuff goes, I think that was a key element in my healing because I think, you know, I think oftentimes people, when they become sick, it's just the immediate focus on what can I do physically? How can I change? What can I do? And I think that's a great, obviously, mindset to have, but I think healing for me came when I addressed it all. 
when I address the emotional side, the spiritual side, the mindset side. And I do think that having a particular mindset to help you heal is really important. At least it was for me and it may not be for others, but I think uh, when I was going through it, I was in such denial for so long. I remember there was a season, I didn't post for like up to two years on my Instagram um, after I kind of figured out what was going on because I was gaining weight, I couldn't work out, heck, I couldn't even get out of bed. I didn't want people to know that that was my new life. I had no idea what was going on. I swear I didn't like take a picture of myself because I hated how I looked for like two years. So it was just like in a constant state of denial for so long. And it was just like, how is this my life? I was very much playing a victim when I look back and it was okay. That was my process. Um, but I think, uh, and I just felt so alone. And obviously with a lot of the things that I have and maybe some of what the listeners have too, it really gets you, gets you uh, mentally and emotionally. Like I wasn't even the same person. I went through depression. I went through suicidal thoughts. Like I just wasn't myself. And I think there was a lot of that, that wasn't my fault, you know, but I think on top of it, um, just looking at that mindset piece and, and just knowing that it could make a difference was something that I could control, you know, how I thought about my symptoms, how I thought about, you know, overcoming them, knowing that I could heal, having hope, you know, um, and I think a lot of that came from good association, you know, making sure whoever I was around was positive, was uplifting, was um, encouraging me and knowing that I could heal, wasn't like freaking out about my diagnosis and like, oh my gosh, this is so bad, you know, um, so I think association and I think a lot of that mindset piece for me was just reading, you know, one of the first books that I read was um, You Can Heal Your Life by Louise Hay. And you know, regardless of what you believe, your spirituality, whatever, I think there's a lot of truth to some of her, of her understanding of, of healing. You know, she, she was diagnosed with cancer and healed herself through her thoughts, you know, because I think a lot of times what we focus on just amplifies. And so if we're constantly thinking, oh, you know, I'm never going to get better. You know, I have no control. My body sucks. I'm such a loser. I'm, I'm terrible. You know, you're not, that's not going to be the mindset to help you heal. You know, you have to start thinking and affirming yourself that you are powerful. You do have control. You can get better. You're, you're okay. You're safe, you know? And I think that was a huge part for me. And then also just surrendering and having patience and knowing that, okay, Emily, it's not a race, you know, time's on your side. Um, and I think that was really tough for me to be at. And I think, again, that didn't help my healing. It was honestly when I just surrendered it and was like, hey, this is, this is my life. This is what I'm going through. You know, maybe one day my pain is going to become my platform. Maybe I'm going through all this for a, for a reason and it's all going to be okay. I think that was truly when I felt like my symptoms started to get better versus just like, what can I do? What can I control? How can I starve myself to hopefully lose weight? It was just stress all the time. What can I do? What can I do? into just like, okay, I'm just going to be in this place and I don't like it, but I'm going to keep striving, but I'm going to strive in a surrendered state. And, um, so I think that's at least some of the mindset that I, I really resonate with. And I think a lot of people do, and just taking ownership in your thoughts, you know, cause I think before I, you know, and a lot of what we do, my, my husband and I, you know, we're around, um, really great entrepreneurs and, and just, um, so on, on, in an environment of growth. And so I think that really helped me too, because it was always like, how can you get better? Maybe this is your situation, but how can you get better on the situation? So I was constantly immersed in that type of a mindset, which I think really helped me, but it made me aware that I actually had power over my, over, over my thoughts. Whereas growing up, it's just like, I think you think whatever you think is truth. You know, if you think, if you're insecure, then you're insecure, you know, but why don't you challenge that? You know, why don't you start to uh, change that and change those deep rooted beliefs? And one program too that people may um, want to look into that really helped me is a program called DNRS, which stands for Dynamic Neural Retraining System. And it's by a woman named Annie Hopper. And uh, she really looks at healing the limbic system. And you can go on her website. There's so many testimonials of people healing from multiple chemical sensitivities, mold, autoimmune diseases. And she really just takes you through, you know, how it works, the science, um, the power of your mind, but 
the piece that she talks to and speaks to in that, that program is really healing that limbic system. Because when you're sick for so long, I think you start to see sickness everywhere. You just start to assume that you'll get sick. I remember there was a time where like every new home I went to or every new place, I'm like, this has mold, I'm gonna get sick or the chemicals, like I smell something, like this is gonna make me sick, or eating a certain food, like I don't wanna eat that because that's gonna make me sick. Again, that's not a great mindset to have. And I think a lot of it isn't even something that we're aware of. And so her program goes into, again, the science, but then helping that limbic system be repaired and start to believe that you're gonna get better again, start to uh, visualize a better life for yourself, um, because that amygdala in the limbic system, your amygdala is that place where your fight or flight response is. And so fight or flight's amazing. You know, when we were cavemen, and we had to run from a saber tooth tiger, you know, it, it was a good thing and it still can be, but I think oftentimes, and not even people that are chronically ill, I think most people are often in a state of fight or flight all the time just constant stress mode, con looking for just triggered all the time. And so that program really helps calm that and uh, starts to repair that and heal that. And uh, that, that, and she also has a book if listeners are curious too, but that's a, that's a great resource. You know, uh, that's, that's such a hot topic right now, healing the limbic system. I think that's going to really resonate with a lot of people out there. Um, it's, it's also just, sort of quantum healing in a way, you know, just really tuning in and, and realizing that, yes, instead of viewing things as restrictive, see them as opportunities. And I know it just sounds so little, but it really is. It's just changing the mindset because before you know it, I, uh, another thing I say is fake it till you make it. I mean, just, just keep charging forward and keep trying to be as patient and positive as possible because um, you know, you may or may not get to a place where you're like, oh my gosh, I'm healed, you know, and I'm back better than I ever ha was before. You know, we don't know. We don't know with this crazy Lyme disease. So <laughs> I appreciate that. And I really appreciate you coming on and, and sharing your journey and wisdom with all of us. Um, Emily has a great Instagram page. It's full of fashion and food. Yeah. I mean, the, the photos of your food, I, you know. <laughs> They're, they they just are amazing and they give me so many great ideas every day um, and lifestyle tips and just also great recipes too that you have. And you can follow Emily on Instagram at Emily Ann, that's E-M-I-L-Y-A-N-N-E Buchan, which is B-U-C-H-A-N, Emily Ann Buchan. And again, it was so such a pleasure to meet you. I hope you come on again. We wish you all the best and tell your husband we said hello to. <laughs> all right, I will. Thank you so much for having me.